the goal for each podcast episode is for us to be honest, open, and transparent. While conversations do include mental health, this show does not replace support from a licensed mental health professional. If you feel triggered by any of these conversations, please feel free to take a break from the episode and check in with your support system. So mental health is our emotional, psychological, and social well-being. It's how we think, it's how we feel, it's how we act, it's how we relate to other people. And that is a full picture, the full person, which we go back to from the beginning, you know, it's looking at the person as a whole individual and knowing good mental health is all those things are in balance, right? And mental illness means that something is an imbalance. And so how do we help that person with whatever that struggle is so that their mental health can be balanced or improved? What's going on, everyone? Thank you for tuning in to another episode of Unlearn the Lies About Mental Health, the podcast. I'm your host, Abraham Scully, and you are tuned into the podcast for young adults and leaders in education wanting to learn how to create safe spaces for honest dialogue about mental health. And as you know, if you are a frequent listener of the podcast, we bring on guests who can either share some tips, strategies on how we can have these honest conversations, whether on campus or in the workplace. Um, but then we also have individuals who are open and courageous enough to share their personal story and their journeys of how they have maneuvered and navigated through mental health challenges. Um, today, we have a guest and just like every other episode, we're bringing a phenomenal conversation. I know there's gonna be so much value that you receive from this podcast. And without further ado, I want to go ahead and introduce our guest for the show, Nathalie Williams. How are you? Good. How are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much for joining. I really appreciate it. Thanks for having me. Yeah, of course. So if we can start off by uh, you just kind of introducing yourself a little bit to the listeners. Uh, who are you? What do you do? What interests you these days? Just kind of give us some background. Okay, excellent. So um, I'm Matthew Williams. I'm the director of outpatient case management, psych support, and the community action team for Lakeview Center in Walton County. So I've been working uh, with Lakeview since 2011. I'm a licensed mental health counselor for the state of Florida. Uh, I got my master's in Chicago at Roosevelt University, and I got my undergrad from the University of Georgia in psychology. So that's kind of my education experience wise I've done a lot career wise I did a domestic violence shelter in Chicago is my internship went down to Georgia back home for a little bit and worked with juvenile offenders in home and their families and really helping youth try to make choices and help them maybe not reoffend again that's the goal moved to Pensacola got connected with Lakey pretty quickly thankfully and worked at their acute stabilization unit uh, which was quite an eye-opening experience right after getting my master's degree. Moved into child outpatient, had the opportunity to start up a, a residential girls uh, group home for girls in foster care, and then came out here to Walton County and been serving the programs out here. So a lot of experience, a lot of populations, and a lot of background. I love it. So if I'm hearing correctly, you're originally from Georgia? Yes. St. Simon's okay. Island is my hometown. Say that again. St. Simon's Island. Okay. In Georgia. In Georgia. It's an island okay. off the coast of Georgia. People get really confused when I say that, but yes. Yeah. I've never heard of it. Sounds cool though. <laughs> yeah, so yeah. you're, you're from Georgia. You went to Chicago and now you said you're in Fort Walton or Pensacola. I live in Pensacola. My location of my programs is in Walton County. So I make the commute out here uh, for my programs. Got you. How did you go from Chicago to Pensacola? We always have a story, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. People you know, connections, relationships uh, would be kind of the brief way to describe that transition. I love, I love Pensacola. I love the opportunity. I love the culture. There's a lot to do, but then 
I don't know, it has small town feel at the same time. Chicago was an experience in itself, the city and, and just learning that culture too. So, but St. Simons is a very, very small town. So I was happy to kind of make the commute and to now call Pensacola home. That's cool. So it sounds like with your, at least your professional experience, you've always been in some sort of role that has a kind of clinical and or I'm feeling some social work a little bit. I'm feeling some mental health. Has that always been a passion for you or did you see that as a direction that you would take? Like, and how long has that been your focus in terms of going in that direction? No, it hasn't. Uh, growing up, I actually come from a whole family of attorneys, and that's like not an exaggeration. Mom, dad, brother, sister, sister-in-law are all attorneys. And so I thought that was the route that I was going to go. But my sister's a licensed social worker before she went back to law school. So I, I got to see her experience, and she actually got her degree up in Philadelphia before she moved back home. So she had a lot of just stories and just amazing things that she did with her, her degree. And I knew that that law really probably wasn't where my heart was. I will say that I think we most of us, if not all of us, have a story that guides us in one way or another. And, you know, my dad has been in recovery since I was 10. So I do, I do think my background comes from a part of that and seeing what a difference it makes when you get help and you get the support around you, what a, what a change it makes in our family and his life and, and our relationship. So that was a, a piece too. So seeing that, and then in, in college, I had a really close friend who she had a, actually had a mental break when we were roommates. And that was my first true experience of seeing that change and that just drastic relationship change and personality change and I really wanted nothing more but to help her and so I felt my purpose change for sure wow so I didn't study social work but I'm I'm obsessed with all things kind of like humans and human behavior so uh, I think I heard at, at one point the approach that social workers take has a lot to do with bio, psycho, social, and I believe spiritual as well. So seeing how all of these components interact and how they ultimately shape someone's state of being. And what I'm hearing from you in terms of some of the experiences that you've had within your family and then what you've been exposed to, it makes sense how you can align yourself with what you're doing today. I'd love to hear you, you share that your dad's in recovery. I have mental illness in my family. I have uh, substance use and abuse in my family as well. And uh, growing up in a Jamaican household in Miami, Florida, I didn't believe that mental health was a real thing. And it wasn't until my first year in college where I became overwhelmed with stress being a first generation college student and kind of going through all of the changes and transitions that happens with you moving from one place to a totally different place and you don't know anyone and now you have all these responsibilities. So obviously it led to me being stressed, but I became overwhelmed and ultimately developed major depressive disorder. Now, all of what I was experiencing was clear to anyone that was educated that, that I was dealing with a mental health challenge. But for me, not having that education or exposure or even knowledge about these things, all I knew was that something was off. I knew that I was changing psychologically and I didn't know why, I didn't know how to get back to the old me. And I was desperate to get answers to get better. I'm curious to know in your own personal experience, you mentioned your dad uh, being in recovery. You mentioned, you know, seeing a friend have a, a mental breakdown. In what, in what way does mental health have that personal attachment either for you specifically in terms of you seeing how it's affected your, your life, your day to day? And, and yeah, just share a little bit about, you know, what that did for you or, or how that impacted you. It made me 
want to advocate. It made me want to give a voice to this thing it's because a lot of times, like you said, people don't talk about it. There, there is that, there's that stigma, that shame behind admitting and being open about mental health and what does that mean and what does that mean for your relationship with others and there's some fear, you know, and and not understanding produces fear and it definitely just I just wanted to take what I had experienced and and turn it into something positive and try to help as as much as I I could. Um, a lot of people do go in the field because of their personal experiences and like, oh, I want to, I want to help all these other people, which is great. But also at the same time, you need some self-awareness and you have to be mindful that just because I have a story doesn't mean it's that other person's story. And, and, but how can it, how can we show compassion and how can we be that support for someone else to help them figure out where they want to be or determine what path they want to go down along their journey. So that's, that's kind of how I, I view that in my experiences. Yeah. So taking all of that, like your personal experience, your professional background, what you've studied, what does your day-to-day look like in your current role? My current role is I've been very fortunate working with Lakeview this amount of time. I've transitioned throughout the different positions and programs. And and now I I take on more of a leadership role managing these various programs, but managing and providing support to my staff and to those that are in the field doing the work um, is really what role I serve. But I also do a lot of crisis support too. Um, Because I'm a licensed mental health counselor, uh, I can complete the paperwork for a Baker Act. I can provide that support and that assessment if needed. So that I get pulled into a lot of situations where those assessments need to be made. But really, it's just providing support to my teams that are serving those in our community and making sure that there are holes in services and how do we do our best to to fill those holes. Like how do we wrap around those in our community? Because it does take not just us as a mental health substance abuse agency to do it. It takes everyone. It takes the the jails, it takes the hospitals, it takes the schools, it takes the mental health, it takes the primary care. You know, it's everyone coming together to serve those in our community because we can't do it by ourselves. Yeah, and I love that. And and the fact that um, you do work for Lakeview and and Lakeview is one of the major or if if not the major uh, behavioral health um, institution here. Uh, It's very important that there's a focus on partnership, collaboration, and how can we work together as a collective to achieve the goals, which is to support our community. And I think, you know, you coming with that approach is very effective um, because it's never a one size fits all approach. It's never a a cookie cutter answer. Everyone has an individual experience, a unique story. They need unique support. And in order for us to really meet those needs, collaboration must be a part of a part of the the picture. So I think the you talked about Baker Act, right? And um, I think that term is kind of thrown out a lot, but many people may not know what that is. Can you can you talk a little bit about that before I get into another question? Yeah, and and I do think that term itself comes with fear, and that term itself comes with people who they hear that and they're like. I, I don't want that to happen. That's a bad thing. And the the purpose truly of a Baker Act is is when someone is a harm, deemed a harm to themselves or someone else, and either others may determine that due to their symptoms or their the risk factors can't the individual can't determine that themselves. Uh, a licensed mental health counselor, or other providers with the correct cred- credentials would be able to complete the assessment to determine if they need a higher level of care, which would be once the form is completed, it goes to a receiving facility and they would 
they are basically will go there, they're held there. They have 72 hours for the provider to determine if they need to stay based on the safety concerns or if they can be released. Really though, it if someone is a harm to themselves and that means not just, I'm not taking care of myself in regards to today, I didn't take my vitamins, right? Like we know, like I'm having thoughts that I wanna kill myself. I have a plan and have a means to do that, that would be deemed uh, where an assessment would come in to determine what that means. The last thing we wanna do is complete a Baker Act on someone who should not meet, who doesn't meet criteria. That would be a misuse of, of that. So it really is providing a proper assessment, making sure they're, they have proper resources in the community or supports at home if they don't meet criteria. Because sometimes it's just identifying what the supports are for that person, bringing those supports to the table, finding out how those people can better support the individual. And that's all the person really wanted. And then, you know, the assessment doesn't need to be completed, but there's, there's a lot of levels and parts to that for sure. Yeah. And, and obviously, as you mentioned, it, it, it's based on the state of the individual, like what care do they need? And when we talk about mental health and, and services, intervention, all these different things, there are so many routes that someone can take to get care. But I think the question becomes for a lot of people is how do I know where to go? How do I know what works for me based on the state that I'm in? And I love how you made that clear distinction. Like if you are thinking about killing yourself, you have a plan of the means, then this is what you need. So I love that distinction there. Can you tell us the difference between inpatient and outpatient care? So yes, absolutely. There's various levels of care and even inpatient itself can come with degrees of care because there's inpatient when you're in an acute hospital setting, like a receiving facility uh, under a Baker Act, right? That would be the highest level of acute care. Uh, there then is inpatient residential level of care, which is where you go and you would stay at a program or a facility, depending on your treatment, depending on the program length, it can range from 30 days to three months to, to longer, depending on a lot of different factors. Then there's the next kind of step down would even be an in-community program support. Uh, basically, coming and meeting the person where they are, full wraparound services, because your symptoms are so significant or severe that maybe an outpatient biweekly appointment isn't able to meet the need. And the, the symptoms are significant risk factors that if they're not addressed could result in a residential level of care. So those community teams are really being increased because everyone sees the benefit of if you can meet someone where they are, if you can meet them out in their, in their community, in their space, to provide them the resources to be successful in their space without having to take them out, who wouldn't want that, right? Like we all, if we can remain home with the people that love us and care about us, which is, is the hope, right? That that's, you know, that would be an ideal world that we all live like that that if we can have full services to wrap around children, adults, families, to keep them from needing a higher level of care, that that would be the goal of, of in community. And then outpatient level of care is what people usually think of coming to an office or even now a lot of telehealth is being provided uh, biweekly, ideally uh, counseling, go in, you talk to a counselor, but then you can go home and be successful. And the risk factors are usually not as significant, but mental health and substance abuse is very high. So all levels are seeing high risk factors, no matter what level of care you're in. Awesome. So when someone is, is receiving care and they're at, they're in a more critical state where they need that, that support, is there a system or process in place to help transition that individual as they they get better? Or what does that look like in terms of, for example, let's say I need I need to to be in a residential facility because 
I am thinking about killing myself. I have the means. But then as time goes on and I'm getting uh, care in this residential facility, I no longer, for lack of better words, fit the criteria of someone who needs this level of care and may even be taking up space for someone who could benefit from being in the position that I'm in. So now I need to take a step down to get a different level of care. Is there some sort of system or process in place where that's 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 happening on a consistent or frequent or in, a, in an effective way? Yes, I know here at Lakeview, if, if we have someone who is coming from a higher level of care, we do kind of transition staffings, transition type meetings from that level of care to the next level of care to talk about, you know, before they're discharged, what's they're going to be their follow-up plan? Who are they going to be linked to? Even the goal and what we try to do as well is, is do like a transition session from the current provider, current therapist at the, the residential program to the next provider that is either like in community program and do a kind of a joint handoff. We call that a warm handoff between the two programs, because the last thing you want is to go from a higher level of care, you're feeling better. And then all of a sudden you, you get discharged and you're like, what do I do now? Right? Like no one wants to feel that uh, you want progress. You want to move forward. And so it really does take, we always say warm handoff, that collaboration, uh, that coordination of care between the two levels and providers and and which goes back to the full wraparound, right? Because it's not just when someone's coming from a residential level of care back into the community, it's not just about mental health. Like you want to make sure, especially youth, we want to make sure that the school is, is involved in those communications and, and every primary care provider, the uh, psychiatry provider, that everyone is in an understanding of how the person is doing and how we can continue to support them and help them be successful once they leave the residential level of care. I love it. So speaking of our community specifically, Northwest Florida, what does that look like? Are there any specific programs that you can make mention of in terms of all of the different levels of care? What is that? What can people who are listening to this say, you know, I can benefit from that, or I'm made aware that this does exist. You talked about some um, community programs as well. I'm just interested, interested to know, like, what does that look like for Lakeview? So Lakeview, a lot of people don't even realize how many programs we actually have in yeah. across many counties. They, I mean, we do so much. Uh, I would kind of say the main hub is in Pensacola and Escambia County, uh, where a lot of our primary programs are located, but we serve uh, Avalon Center out in Milton. We serve all the way to Long County, which is where uh, my programs are located. Uh, we do have a residential programs for adults and youth. We do have community-based programs. Some of our community-based programs, the one in Walton County that I, one of the ones that I'm over is called the Community Action Team. So we serve at-risk youth who are identified as either a risk to have acute admissions like under a Baker Act, uh, risk of expulsion from school, uh, may already have legal charges, and, and things of the sort is what criteria you'd have to meet one of those based on your age range in order to be considered for the program. But really what I always tell people is for us, even if you just call client registration, which I can get that number now or yeah. whenever, they would call client registration and get open in our system. And then we will link you to your, your first appointment. Usually outpatient is the first start for a lot of people, if, especially if you haven't been connected to services, because then we can determine what are your needs how can we serve you? We're not asking for you to know, right? Like, how can I ask you as someone who is, is struggling or may not even know what resources exist to, to know where you need to be? But I always tell people, if, number one is safety. If someone you know or love is talking about things in a way that's a safety concern, immediately get help, take it seriously. Let, let a professional determine 
how we what what the next steps needs to be. There are a lot of levels. There are a lot of services, and it, it's just making that first step is important. You mentioned the client registration. So, would you say after checking safety and identifying that support is needed, reaching out to client registration would be the the good you know the best next yeah, step? Just for things like you specifically and all the services, you're like I just want to see what kind of support I can get. Uh, they would they would call client registration and get open, and they would get them scheduled for their their first appointment, depending especially where they're residing. Yeah. Um, so what's that number? Eight five zero four six nine three five zero zero. Awesome. So you talked a little bit about the programs. I'm still I'm still if you can share however much you can share, like what. What do these programs look like? You're, you're supporting at-risk youth. What are they doing? What are they a part of? Like, what what's happening in these programs? <laughs> oh, yeah. And I know there's so much. I know we only have, like, a certain amount of time. If I really went into all of our programs, we would be, like, per day. But the Community Action Program, one of those one ones I mentioned for the at-risk youth, that specific program, every identified youth, we serve youth and their whole family because we all know the identified person served isn't just the child, right? It's it's the family. It's, it's those in the home that are living that life with that youth. Uh, so we fully wrap around the family. They have a therapist assigned. They have a case manager. They have a mentor to work on independent living skills, maybe career building, it, you name it. We have a nurse in our program just full wrap around of services. Awesome. We meet, we meet you out at school. We come out to the home ah. and, and it's, and it's of no, no speed to you, which is great, right? Not a lot of programs to say, like you can say that, but I will say the community action team is, is really meant to keep higher levels of care from happening to help reduce those risk factors. If it's, if we can do that, that's the goal. And so it just full wraparound of services for the identified person served in their family. That is awesome. I think one of the challenges that we hear or see a lot is not necessarily that there's a lack of resources, but there is no awareness of what resources are accessible. And so we're not taking advantage of these resources because we don't even know they exist. So thanks so much for sharing that. Now, with working with young people, and obviously, if you're working with young people, you have to work with their families because we don't want to support the young people and help them behaviorally and mentally. And then they go to homes where it's not safe for them mentally and emotionally. So getting families in these programs and having these conversations is essential if we want real change, real impact, and and really to help the individuals that are part of these programs. As you're working with families and the young people, do you see any stigma or shame around maybe needing these types of services or engaging in the services or even, you know, making the call to take advantage of any of the services. And if you do see any stigma around that, what does that look like? Yeah, I do. Unfortunately, mental health itself comes with stigma, stigma. But when I think about reason why people don't seek services, youth included, family history, like I think you in the beginning, when you were talking about your culture and that kind of that's not a norm, like, you don't talk about those things and you were trying to wrap your head around that. You know, we have cultures that that's just, you know, we handle it within our home. We handle it here and you don't seek outside help. And so that, that can be a component. Uh, lack of knowledge of services is a big component. People don't even know where to start. It can become really overwhelming. A lot of people too is not even being able to access services. I always re remind people you know, we have to meet people where, where they are. How do we expect people to improve mental health if their own basic needs aren't even being met? I know here, especially in, in Walton County, it's very rural. Like we have a lot of people who basic needs aren't being met. So how are we going to 
ask them like, why didn't you, <laughs> you didn't make it to your appointment. Well, yeah, I didn't make it to my appointment. I didn't have gas money to put in my car to get to the appointment. And if I have a, if I have to choose between a counseling appointment or going to my doctor to get a medication for medical need, I'm going to choose my primary care doctor, even though mental health is, I'm not saying is any less important, but these are the decisions that people are having to make. So I do think that's why community services are so beneficial because it's, seeing the importance of the full wraparound service, the full bringing everyone to the table so that those barriers that someone could be hitting to even get services, we can help them overcome those. Yeah, I'd love for you to share. It can be within your role at Lakeview and the program uh, you're a part of now or just in your professional career. What has been a story that, has followed you up until this day in terms of you seeing the impact that the work you're doing has had on a young person or any individual. This podcast is powered by Speaks to Inspire, the mental health solution for young adults suffering in silence. Did you know that students who experience shame and hold negative perceptions about mental health conditions are less likely to reach out for help? By marrying the art of storytelling with mental health education, Speaks to Inspire is creating safe spaces through comprehensive, high-impact programs that help colleges, universities, and schools increase engagement and retention. Learn how you can bring a Speaks to Inspire speaker to your campus by visiting www.speakstoinspire.com forward slash speakers. Oh gosh, stories. <laughs> I would probably say so. I started Lakeview Center has a girls group home for girls in foster care, and a boys group home for also boys in foster care. So I helped start Arcadia Place from the ground up, and so I was the supervisor to staff, and I was also the therapist to these teenage females in foster care, and so. It was, it's basically a last resort placement for these girls who need a home. And so I, ha I mean, I would have girls that were 15 year, 15 years old with 45 plus placements. Wow. And so they would come to me and I knew that Arcadia had to be their home in the sense of that was my duty is to provide them a home. And I remember one girl came from South Florida a history of running away and no, I'm just like, she wasn't going to stay. She was going to run the minute she came to Arcadia. And I remember she stayed. And the next morning I, I walked in and I said, good morning. Like, so good to see you. And she was like, okay. And I, I remember saying like, I appreciate you being here. Like, I appreciate that you didn't leave. And not only did she not leave, she, she didn't want to leave until she aged out. So she was with me for a very long time. And I just remember she did really well. She was very successful in our program. And I remember because she was doing so well, they wanted to try to place her somewhere else so that another girl could come into the home. Mm -hmm. And she was like, no, like <laughs> I'm not doing that. And so but I just think it just goes back to people want to be viewed as human beings and want to be treated as human beings and seen for who they are and not because I didn't make her feel like in quotes a client, right? Like I valued her and I appreciated her for not leaving. And like for her, that like shock of like, you even care that I'm still here. And I know it, for some people that may seem really insignificant, but I always just go back to the foundation of that connection and how important that treating people as human beings and being kind, how it can go so far and someone's success. Yeah, it, it reminds me of this, this nonprofit organization I'm on the board of. It's called Only Seven Seconds. 
And the whole premise is that it only takes seven seconds to reach out to someone and check in uh, because of the devastation that comes from loneliness. And when we think about human connection and our need and desire for human connection, it's always the quote unquote little things. It's mm -hmm. never like I need to solve this problem right now or else whatever. No, it's, it's literally let me be here with you now. I, I do this, uh, this training, uh, community training, a suicide prevention. And one of the, the tools that I share with attendees is, and it's, it's the simplest thing. And then when I say it and kind of break it down, they're like, oh, that makes sense. But it's listening, right? And listening to understand rather than listening to respond. And when we're able to really sit with that person and listen to whatever it is that they have to say, that makes a big difference. And um, that's, that's all what I'm, what I'm hearing in the story that you're, you're sharing with that, with that individual, that young lady. So I love it. So we, we talk about the services. We talk about how there are different levels of care. And this is the unlearn the lies about mental health podcast. And so I'm really trying to identify what are some of these lies, what are some of these misconceptions that people have about mental health, about mental health conditions, and how we can unlearn these lies. I'd love to hear from you. Um, how can we eradicate mental health stigma? What are some things that you think would be impactful? I think a, a big piece is even our language of mental health that instead of saying that person is a drug addict, hmm. it's that person struggles with addiction. Instead of saying that person is, in quotes, a schizophrenic, that person suffers with schizophrenia. It's taking, it's seeing the person as an individual. It's separating them and understanding we are not what we are diagnosed. We are not our addiction we are a person who struggles with those things, just like you might struggle with diabetes, you might struggle with high blood pressure, but you are you don't introduce yourself as, hi, I, I have, I'm high blood pressure, right? Like you are an individual that suffers with high blood pressure. You are an individual that struggles with addiction. And I think learning how to make our language more accepting and warm and making a person feel like the individual that they are, it is a key component to, to breaking the stigma. And then education. I think a lot of people don't know and what they don't know produces fear and that mental health can be scary. That, that is, I mean, mental health can be scary in the sense of I'm overwhelmed. I don't know what to do with how I feel. And people don't even know how to, where do I go with that? And if you don't know, how how do you to pave that path? How do you go down that road that you need to go to get the help that you need? And the cycle begins. And so being educated, being supportive, making people feel heard, not dismissed. I think for youth, it's so easy because we always say kids can be kids. And developmentally, you know, we're going through a lot of changes. And of course, they're really impulsive. And it's quick to dismiss a lot of behaviors because you want to say like, oh, that's just a kid being a kid. Right. But I think if you stop for a second and ask them and check in with them and let them feel heard, right. You might know it's not just a kid being a kid or it is, but it's a kid being a kid that needs help and, and then getting them that help and not dismissing their statements of, I don't want to be here anymore or, observing changes if you see behavioral changes in your child or someone in your classroom pay attention to that those are signs that, that something may not be okay and it may not be that they're directly mental health it could be that they're struggling at home to find food they're struggling at home to pay a light bill you know i mean there could be a lot of reasons for the changes but still those things impact the full person and the person's mental health. And so I just think it's, it's being observant. It's making people feel heard and being aware of how our communication 
and our language impacts one another. Speaking of language, I have one more question because um, I always hear in conversation, I can't say always, but majority of the time here in conversation or in watching something that a lot of times mental health is synonymous with a mental illness. For example, mental health means depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or bipolar disorder. But as you know, there is a clear distinction between like mental illness and and mental health. And you just you just brought up a really good point about language and the first point that you shared about the difference between this is an individual that struggles with depression versus versus like this person is depressed or the you know just the language behind it i think a big part of that is just the accuracy in that shift versus is this person depressed or is this person dealing with depression right mm-hmm. it's one is one is actually you know true and one is not true so so it there's a big component of like unlearning what we have been taught or what we've heard from culture, from society, from movies, from all these different things and being open to learning something new. So my final question is uh, mental health. So what is mental health to you? So mental health is our emotional, psychological and social well-being. It's how we think, it's how we feel, it's how we act, it's how we relate to other people. And that is, it's a full picture, the full person, which we go back to from the beginning, you know, it's looking at the person as a whole individual and knowing good mental health is all those things are in balance, right? And mental illness means that something is an imbalance. And so how do we help that person with whatever that struggle is so that their mental health can be balanced or improved? Thank you for that. So I I said that was the last question, but I just thought of another <laughs> yeah, one. Yeah, Sorry. Another one's coming. Go for it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there is a parent right now or a teacher or a guardian who's listening to this and they are like at their wits end with what it takes to support the young person that they are responsible for or are teaching or whatever. What do you share with that teacher, parent, you know, guardian to give them the encouragement or steps in terms of how they can better support the young person who actually needs support versus being dismissed or or giving up on them? I think it's also providing that support to the parent and to the teacher. I think they also get overlooked their their fears, their anxieties, their worries also get dismissed because of the weight of maybe mm. all the, the, the students in the classroom. And so it's validating everyone. It's validating that teacher. It's validating that principal. It's validating that doctor. It's validating that parent, that foster parent, that you are not alone. How can we work together to help you with what it is you're faced with. But then it's the same communication with the youth. You're not alone. I know you may feel alone, but you are not alone. And how can I help you? What is it that you need? What can I do? And not me thinking, I know what I know what you need, right? Like that's not my role is to tell you what you need. It's to help you determine what it is that you need and help how can I help you get there? You tell me what you need and how can I help? Is there anything, 1% of something I can do today to make today a better day for you? And I think if we we do that, the small steps, that seven seconds, that sitting down, just being present with the individual, being present with the youth, being present with the teachers, that's where change happens. That's where dialogue happens. And I, I guess that's, kind of the same for for all of them for all of us right we all just want to feel heard we all want to feel that we matter and and I think if we feel that we'll go a long way I love it no better way to end that I'd love for you to share uh, how can someone 
connect with you. Maybe they're listening to this show and they'd like to say, you know, thank you, Nathalie, uh, for sharing what you shared or love to, you know, continue the conversation. How can they connect with you if you're on any social media platforms or how, I mean, and how can they get connected with Lakeview? With Lakeview, start with client registration, the number I provided, which is 850-469-3500. It's the first step to get in, to get open for services. With me directly, at this point, I feel like everyone knows what my work cell number is. I have no shame in it. I sleep with it <laughs> under my pillow, so I run too many programs not to stay connected. So it is 850-635-2776. If you just need to know like what direction to go, uh, if it's not in Walton County, if it's in a scammy county, I can link you the best that I can. Obviously, I want to be able to help. Uh, I am on LinkedIn. I don't know how to tell you the direct link to that besides the name. <laughs> um, but no, yeah, I, just, I just want to help. I just, whatever I can do to help. So to make one person make a difference in one life, you know, that's what we all should strive for. Awesome. Any final words you'd like to leave with, with listeners? Or do you think you covered everything? I, I mean, I've, I feel like I would say what I've already said. I, I don't know. Just okay. Be present, be mindful how a small act of kindness goes a long way for sure. Awesome. Thank you so much, Nathalie. This was uh, very insightful. And I think uh, many people would leave understanding terms that they've heard, but now they, you know, have a definition for or an understanding. And I think it's it's going to be very valuable uh, for those of you who are listening and you are a frequent listener of the show. Thank you for listening. Be sure to share this episode if you know anyone that can find value in it. If this is your first time joining the Unlearn the Lies About Mental Health podcast, be sure to subscribe so that you never miss another episode. In terms of resources, I want to go ahead and share a few resources with our listeners. If you're an educator, um, we have our free guide. It's 14 ways to support your students' mental health. Uh, the link is in the description. Feel free to download that guide. Um, absolutely free. Some practical and um, cost effective ways to engage students as it relates to mental health. Also, the Suicide and Crisis Lifeline is now 988 for those of you who don't know. And anyone can call or text 988 for immediate chat and or phone support. Speaking with a crisis counselor is 24 seven. So if uh, Nathalie is sleeping, you can call 988 <laughs> <laughs> and uh, you'll get somebody that picks up. The great thing about this resource too, is that you don't have to be in crisis. Like maybe it's 3 a.m. in the morning and everyone that you know and love and that loves you is asleep and you just need to talk to someone. You can text 988, you can call 988 and you can talk to someone immediately. Also, our general resources, if you'd like to go to Speaks to Inspire, that's the number two, inspire.com forward slash resources. We have a ton of free resources for you to download or just become you know, aware of. And then finally, our community. If you are not in our Facebook group yet, you need to come on in. We have a ton of our guests that have joined the show who are in the community, uh, advocates from all over the country that are in the community. And we just continue the conversation. What ideas can you bring to the table? What podcast episodes or conversations would you like to hear? So you can go to Facebook and type in Unlearn the Lies About Mental Health and you'll find the Facebook group. Just tap that join button. I'll let you in and I'll see you in the, in the group. Without further ado, I'd like to end this show. <laughs> so thank you so much for listening. Thank I hope this was so beneficial much. and uh, take care. Hey, thank you.